And there we are. Okay. Oh, I've already. I was, was going to say, do I? I'm sorry, you said go. Yeah. <laughs> Should I introduce who I am? Um, I've already done a little notation on the voice recording, um, but yeah, let's introduce you to the video as well. So, give me your name and where we are. Hello, I'm Roberta Francis. I live in Chatham, New Jersey, and I've been working for about 40 years on first the Equal Rights Amendment and then uh, many other issues of women's advancement, and uh, have come to the point where while I would picture it's time to uh, quote retire, you don't retire from this kind of work. You shift gears perhaps, but uh, it is something that really is a calling when you're doing it in this way. And so I would like to share a little bit of uh, what got me into this and uh, where I've gone with it and what I picture is the future. But uh, I was uh, in college from 1960 to 1964 and we kept being told we were a transition class and I kept thinking how do they know because how do you know what something's transitioning to but what I realized was we were transitioning out of the 1950s and what preceded that into what the baby boomers were going to bring down on everybody and I think those who were looking at the demographics saw that coming uh, in ways that I at that age couldn't have imagined but what that transition did for me personally and for a lot of people in college at that time, college is a transitional time for everyone when you see new ways of looking at the world. If you're doing it right, you are exploring a whole lot of things that uh, take you to a new place in your life. And so I was very turned on by the civil rights movement that was going on in the early 1960s, a very important time for the country and for uh, equal rights, civil rights around racial justice, and I got very uh, involved in that. But it took me a lot longer to really get it about the issue of justice on the basis of sex, equal rights for women as well as men. So I came out of college um, with my social justice button well uh, charged up, but um, went to graduate school for one year, got married, um, worked for a publisher in Boston while my husband was in graduate school, had two children in 69 and 73, and was what you would call a stay-at-home mom, doing a little bit of uh, copy editing work on the side, um, till I had my feminist click um, in about 1977, I would guess it was, but uh, I was asked, I was a president of my local League of Women Voters in Chatham, New Jersey, and I was asked if I had information in the league files about the Equal Rights Amendment. And I looked and I read it. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And I asked the most naive question I had ever, probably, ever asked before <laughs> in my life, which was, what's to argue? Um, which is what many, many people say when they read the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I found out that what was being argued against the Equal Rights Amendment was the same thing that had been argued against the 19th Amendment, the right to vote for women, um, was argued against all kinds of advances to level the playing field for women and people of color in this country. And so the feminist click, as you will, that I had around the ERA was that I got it for the first time that there was a systemic system of sex discrimination just as there had been and still was in many ways a systemic system of racial discrimination in the country. So it put all that together for me in a way that, I mean now maybe we talk about it as intersectional, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know it was very very much um, just at a gut level for me, oh my goodness yes. and. Another cliche was I had felt I was never, quote, discriminated against on the basis of my sex. I was a good student and was encouraged to go to college, encouraged to go to graduate school, not encouraged to think of those in terms of a career the way I think succeeding generations of women were, but uh, wasn't told I couldn't. So I didn't feel a personal uh, you know, weight of sex discrimination in my life. On the other hand, it 
I realize as I'm saying this, it's sort of how uh, Margaret Mead described, um, well, she said if, if uh, fish were anthropologists, the last thing they would discover was water because they're swimming in it. So as a uh, young woman growing into adulthood in the United States, the last thing I discovered was systemic sex discrimination, metaphorically, because I was swimming in it in so many ways. Uh, it just is the way life was. And so things have changed so incredibly in those succeeding, um, well, 40 years since I got, almost 40 years since I got started on uh, the women's movement, 50 years since I graduated from college, oh my goodness, <laughs> um, that I can understand in a way that we didn't, you know, it was only the ones whose antenna were more, antennae were more uh, sensitive, perhaps, um, who got it earlier, or those whose lives were so directly and clearly impacted by sex discrimination, wage discrimination, violence, et cetera, who got it a lot earlier. But thank goodness more and more people, women and men, of course, are understanding that this is uh, that way. Let me ask you um, a question about that because it went click and then you sort of understood that there was a system of discrimination at work, mm -hmm. that it had been making the same arguments since the arguments had ever been made. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, Possibly a little later with the addition of sort of the Phyllis Schlafly organizations and, mm. and that kind of resistance, but um, what, when you looked back, when the click happened and you sort of reviewed your own life for a second, what... What, how did the view change, right? How did you see your relationship to graduate school, to a career, to, um, to university, right? Differently mm -hmm. than you did when you were coming through it, um, when you realized that the water was there. That's really interesting. I think one thing I, <laughs> that stuck out for me, and it obviously must have meant something to me at the time, because it was a very minor uh, reaction, but I went to graduate school for one year to get a master's in English literature at Boston University. And there was a young woman, a few years older than I was perhaps, in the same studies. Mm -hmm. And she came up mid-year once, all excited, and she said, oh, I just got accepted to Indiana for the PhD program, which was really a you know, feather in her cap. And I said, oh, that's great, but remembered thinking almost, why would she want to do that? Uh, you know, it just wasn't in the script for the people in the mushy middle where I was. She was out ahead. And so I just, again, it must have meant something to me. I must have been stirring already about being aware of such things because I remembered that. I remembered saying, Gail, I guess her name was. I said, that's great, Gail. And then thinking, oh, well, so so what? <laughs> you know, why? <laughs> and and uh, just oblivious. So one thing in retrospect was a little incidents like that jumped out at me as um, markers of how, I gonna, I'll use the words that come to mind first, how brainwashed mm. most of us were to not think in the same way that a male would be thinking about building a career. Mm -hmm. And again, it wasn't all women by any means, but uh, certainly yeah. born in 1943, coming out of the 50s, post-war, women back to the house and kitchen and get pregnant and so on, culture, um, that was all I knew Yeah. Uh, for the early years. Yeah. And again, I was very encouraged. My parents were very supportive of my academic work, of me as a person, and yet never um, in the sense of uh, pushing the envelope in, in those respects. Yeah, it's kind of how you know when you when you are encountering the culture's narrative for you, right? The the system that you're supposed to fit into. That's right. Is that there's a story of how your life is supposed to go. Yes. And you don't even have to think about that, how that story is going to get written. Right. Until you deviate from it. Yes. And then all of a sudden you're writing it by yourself, and that's how you know that's where I was supposed to be. Right? That's right. That's yeah. right. And I've said, and again, uh, I have a daughter. Sam and I have been married for almost... Oh, Lord, 49 years. Yeah. And I don't mean, oh, Lord, negatively. Just, you know, the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a daughter who's 44, a son who's 41, and um, our daughter is, has a PhD in clinical psychology. She has two daughters whom she had about 10 years later in her life than mm -hmm. I had our two kids. Mm -hmm. um, and she's had 
opportunities, I mean, this is so cliche even now as we're talking about it, she's had opportunities because of her imagination for her life not being put in a script for her. But she's also had challenges with that, of balancing the paid employment and the family uh, and so on that I didn't have. So, um, cliche, it's life, <laughs> you know, yeah. that you always must be balancing considerations. But for the generations of women, particularly coming after my generation, um, I think it's far more positive. I wouldn't even call it negative, but it's just that the challenges of making those uh, balances, negotiations, compromises um, are more in the face of the generations of younger women. Mm -hmm. um, and the work family public policy has not kept up. If work family public policy had kept up with this, we would not be um, agonizing over some of the things we do about mm -hmm. who's watching the children, which of course gets sex linked mm -hmm. to how many mothers are watching the children. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, this is not to um, minimize the number of fathers who are uh, doing far more, more nurturing and childcare and even being the home, parent at home doing the nurturing. Uh, that's wonderful. And uh, yet it's still, as Gloria Steinem has said, when she sees the first male being asked, how are you going to balance work and family? She'll feel like we've passed a watershed. Yeah, so. <laughs> now, we, now we've started to work that out. Yes. Do you, do you remember when, because I don't at all, when the um, proposals were coming up for um, things like universal childcare, or at least some way of companies or states or mm -hmm. local governments working out a way to take care of children, you know, while moms working because there's that gap between school in the evening, you yes, know, that, um, yes. that gap between, you know, breakfast and school in the morning sometimes Absolutely. that, um, and young children that need to be looked after in a loving and nurturing way. Right. You know, Absolutely. not just sort of housed. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. The, I have two data points, one of which is I know that without knowing details of the legislation that Nixon had, was, pres I think he vetoed it or perhaps it didn't get out of Congress, but I think he vetoed a major child care bill. Mm -hmm. um, so it went way back to the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the arguments were dredging up all kinds of accusations of literally saying communist plans to have our children be taken care of by the government and brainwashed and this yeah. and that. I mean, it was the same kind of logic, and I say that sarcastically, that we see in most arguments against feminist advances. But, um, or progressive legislation. Of progressive, any yes. Progressive legislation. <laughs> yeah, it's of always the like communists are coming to get us again. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And um, the other thing is a friend of mine around here in uh, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, near Chatham, where I live, mm -hmm. was um, a mom with elementary school, I guess, or maybe middle school kids at home around that time, maybe a little later. And Becky said that there was a, uh, <laughs> the school board was asked to set up a program to let the kids stay at school for lunch. This is how recently it's been that kids, most of the time, in areas like this, at mm -hmm. least suburban, uh, metropolitan New York, when it came home for lunch. My kids did in elementary school in the 70s. Sure. Well, these were really little towns. Yes, you know, they're small so towns, one right up against the other. But yeah, they, but it wasn't far from school to house. No, that's right. And so she remembers the debate at the school board being very vitriolic and that there was a board member, school board, saying it was a communist kind of thing. So it is, for those of us who like to think we apply logic um, at least as much as uh, kind of high up on the bell curve <laughs> average, that's contradictory, isn't it? If you're high up on the bell curve, you're, you're not, not average. average but, um, <laughs> These arguments are so both illogical or unbased in fact, mm. and um, so doctrinaire, so so following an agenda that needs to preserve the divisions between the sexes. Mm -hmm. So, or the roles, the gender roles of the sexes, so um, rigorously yeah. that we we don't believe. When I asked what's to argue about the ERA, I had no idea what a third rail that was to touch. Uh, what a um, absolutely close to the core of people's identity it is mm -hmm. 
to preserve the poles, male, female. I mean, we can get out into the whole issue of uh, sexuality and, and the spectrum that it exists yeah. rather than the poles, the bi mm -hmm. <laughs> bipolar. The balance within people, right? That, oh, Masculine and feminine traits. We are all, you know, uh, genetically, hormonally, everything else. We have all of the same yeah. hormones. The balances are different in right. some cases, or the receptors that take estrogen better than uh, adrenaline right. or testosterone or whatever. I've done, some, this is a digression, but I've done some work on oxytocin, which is being more and more, um, first of all, it wasn't looked at much because it was more of a, quote, female hormone having to do yeah. with childbirth and nursing. Thing. But um, it's fascinating. You can almost do a history of uh, attacks on uh, gender equality by looking at how the research and uh, how the attention has been paid to fight flight, testosterone, adrenaline, as opposed to oxytocin, serotonin, the, you mm -hmm. know, the, the calming, the nurturing, the female hormones. The bonding. The bonding, absolutely. Nice. And so it's, it's all fascinating. Mm. And, and that's one thing that's so satisfying about doing this work. Every issue, and I started out as I say, 10, 15, even years before I had my feminist click about sex discrimination as a system, I had my, I won't even say it's a click, I'd always been, you know, I almost don't remember when I felt that, oh gosh, we have a system of racial discrimination and I should be against it. I mean, I just grew up thinking, oh, this is that. awful. But um, to recognize that after I got hooked by the ERA, that issue led me to, and I'll say metaphorically, three other issues that you couldn't do the ERA without knowing about, and each of those leads you to three other issues, metaphorically, <laughs> that you can't do those issues without knowing about the bigger ones. It's very, talk about interdisciplinary or cross uh, culture or cross uh, discipline yeah. approach to things. That is, I'm just thinking this as I'm saying, as I'm talking, I'm just wondering if that is something that is harder for a lot of people to do. There is a kind of linear way of looking at things and okay, I'm in biology or I'm in history or I'm in this mm -hmm. or that. And when we get into feminist scholarship and interdisciplinary uh, studies and all kinds of wonderful inclusive pedagogy, pedagogy as well as the substance of what's being examined, mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who aren't as comfortable with that. They may even kind of accuse it of being more mushy or something. But hey, that's life. That's life is mushy in yeah. that respect. And to get at the level of um, really engaging with what's going on, you can't be linear. You can't yeah. even predominantly be linear. You have to have the certain linear pieces of your explor exploration. But mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't know. I'm not trying to link that, make that a sex-linked accusation. It's but not. I, it's a yeah. style of thinking, yes. right? It's a, it's a sort of cultural bias towards certain styles of thinking. Yes. And that are valued or not valued. But, you know, it's, it's you're, you're getting at why the ERA or um, something like universal or at least well-supported decent <laughs> child care um, is such a third rail in, and why feminism is such a complicated interdisciplinary thing. Yes. is that the minute you start to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and acknowledging in the Constitution that within our full-fledged human beings, mm -hmm. you are now imagining a new world. All of it. Bingo. And so people feel that instinctively that this group of folks who are sort of out at a vanguard in the way of trying to think and imagine exactly. a, a world, mm -hmm. a way of living, um, are trying to lead all these other people, or asking all these other people to come along with them, and they're or at least they spoiling it for those who want to stay, or behind. spoiling it for those who want to stay behind. Yeah. I mean, you're, you can yeah. stay. We just want to go. That's right. <laughs> we don't, you don't have to come. <laughs> just make room for you us. Go. Yeah, make right. room for us to go. You know, I just it's like the song, "Wake Me Up Before You Go Go." I, I just want my forty acres and a mule. You know, so let me go out there. But yeah. but they sense that, and they sense that you know, you about identity that that the story of how to be the kind of person that I am, right, um, whatever kind of person that is, is mm -hmm. going to change. And yeah, that goes to the root of people. That's yes. really fundamental to who they are. And so you will find, you know, adventurers who um, wind up being feminist activists, for yes. instance. Um, and you will find um, women who are supportive of feminism. Mm -hmm. um, 
who are fairly adventurous and willing to change the way that they live and relate mm-hmm. with the world.